All right, so today in this video, we are gonna be talking about what to do and how to remain empowered in a difficult marriage. And I wanna start off by sharing with you five of the most common things that I see that actually make marriage hard in the first place. The first thing are your differences and your points of disagreement. Lots of times we first find ourselves attracted to someone who is different than ourselves. And so the things that may be a strength for your partner are what draw you in, what you admire about them. But over time, as your differences begin to grow, they become liabilities. They become things that annoy you and frustrate you about this other person. And so when we have differences and we aren't in a position to appreciate those differences or respect those differences, we judge them. And it is the judgment that then causes us to kind of draw a line in the sand in terms of our connection. We look at our partner and we're frustrated, we're angry, we're annoyed that they are being a way that is not the way that we would be. So you wanna take a look at in your own marriage is part of your frustration because you're so different and where maybe in the past you understood those differences, you appreciated those differences, now they just feel like frustrations that make it harder and harder for you to connect. The second thing that I see that often happens with couples is over time they begin to deprioritize the relationship as jobs um, escalate, as children come into the picture, as their responsibilities in other areas of their lives take over the time that they spent, the intentionality that they demonstrated towards maintaining a connection, appreciating each other, valuing each other, prioritizing each other, kind of completely stops. And many of the couples that I work with find themselves living in what feels like a roommate situation, where one person is on one end of the house and the other is in another end of the house. And so in this instance, it is hard to come back together because often what happens is when you're not prioritizing each other, other things begin to fill in that space. And those other things become more enjoyable, more easy for you to engage in than actually taking the time to rebuild and reconnect with your partner. Another thing that I often see is that when couples have a lot of differences, they can't easily get on the same page to make important decisions. That creates a lot of conflict, and instead of feeling like a team, they feel like enemies. And so you enter conversations, you enter decisions that you need to make together feeling like your opponents, feeling like this person is there to make your life harder, to stress you out, to not work with you, and then that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I want you to think about what is it like to have a conversation with someone who feels like a collaborative team member, who feels like someone who wants to hear your perspective and values your opinion versus someone you think is stubborn, selfish, closed-minded, fixed-minded. It's a very different experience that you have in your communication and in your decision-making. Another thing that I often see that makes marriage hard is really this constant state of feeling stuck. I often hear from my clients, we keep having the same conversation over and over again. We have the same argument. I have the same complaint. They have the same defense. And so we're not ever making any progress on our issues. Now, there is a lot of research out there that says that some issues in a relationship are actually not gonna be solved, that you're not gonna get on the same page, you're not gonna agree. But as a coach, even with those instances and even in those circumstances, I think sometimes what matters more than resolving the issue is the approach you take, is the way that you're communicating and treating each other as you're sharing your different perspectives. And most times what is really getting in the way 
is again, that judgment, that belief that this person isn't a team member for you, that this person isn't, you know, caring about what you want and that they are only focused on themselves. And then the last thing that I often see is sometimes we have partnered with someone that as we grow and evolve and as we change over time, they don't continue to be a good fit. I see this happen a lot with my clients where maybe they were initially, you know, drawn together because they were looking for a relationship that offered them a lot of stability and consistency. And over time, as they've grown and as they've evolved, their emotional needs have changed. The desires and the goals that they have for their life are different. And so these couples veer off away from each other. It feels like they just don't fit. It feels like they're just not right for each other. And many times this can happen where you can still look at your partner and say like, you are a really good human being. Like you um, have so many good qualities, but we're just not a good match. So those are some of the things that I see that really create difficulty in a marriage and can really you know, land us feeling disempowered. It can land us feeling stuck. It can land us feeling unhappy for many, many years. So what I want to do now is talk to you about the ways that in those specific circumstances, I see people give up their power. The first is blaming so easy when we are in judgment of our spouse, when we feel like they are wrong and we are right, to blame them, to blame them for the problems, to blame them for the conflict, to blame them for the lack of progress. But whenever we are blaming someone else, we are putting all of the power to make the situation better in their hands. And if our goal is to be empowered, even in a difficult circumstance, we want to start looking at where can I take responsibility for my personal experience? And so if you find yourself ruminating and spending a lot of time thinking about how your partner is wrong, where they have failed you, how they're such a disappointment, you are essentially giving up your power because your attention then becomes focused on what they need to do differently in order for you to feel better. Another place where I see people give up their power is in regret. So again, maybe when you first got together, your relationship was magical. It felt like you were perfectly paired, but over time, you've veered away from each other and you can look back on those decisions of the past and feel like I made a bad decision. I shouldn't have married this person. It was wrong then. I saw the red flags and I didn't pay attention to them. And now look at where we are. Now, regret feels useful, but it never is. Whenever you are looking over your shoulder at the past, at what you did, and there's nothing you can do to change that past, you've expended a lot of energy in what I would say is a really pointless endeavor. And so you want to think about, well, what was it that made me feel like this was a good decision? And you want to honor that past version of yourself that made that choice. You want to also look at what's still true now. What are the good things that, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago, I really loved about our relationship. What parts of that are still there? Okay, that's going to help you to not sit in regret, but to honor the decisions you made with the information that you had then with the mindset that you had at the time and then look for where you can have some power moving forward. Another way I see people give up their power is depending on their partner to change or for circumstances to change until they can feel happy. I've had many people come and say, I would love to get some support for our marriage, but my partner doesn't want to. And so what happens because their partner doesn't want to, because they're waiting around for their partner to open their eyes, for their partner to see things differently, they spend a lot of time giving up the power that they have to move things forward for themselves in a productive way. 
So I want you to think about, are there ways I'm giving up the power that I do have by blaming my spouse and criticizing them for being the problem, for living in regret and you know harping on the coulda, woulda, shouldas, or for waiting and waiting and waiting for my partner to change or for things to change in order for me to feel happy in my life. That being said, let's now talk about the ways that you can be more empowered even in a difficult marriage. The first thing is you have to own and honor and take responsibility for your decisions and your priorities. Many times I have people who are like, I don't know why I'm staying in this marriage. I probably should have left. And I always say there are good reasons in your mind, whether they're conscious reasons or unconscious reasons, that you have chosen to stay in this situation. And so you want to take a look at that. Like you want to look at what's really going on for me if I'm 100% autonomous and I'm a hundred percent you know able to make decisions on my own why am I making the decisions that I'm making and how can I own them when you own your decisions it essentially releases anyone else from needing to show up a certain way from needing to be a certain way from needing to agree with you or do particular things when you own the decision you own the decision it is yours to make and i really advise my clients to love their decisions to honor themselves and the part of themselves that feels like that is the choice that they want to make the second thing that you can do is to create your own standards for what is okay for you and what is not there have been many times when I've talked with clients and if you're paired with someone whose version of healthy looks different than yours, it can be very confusing. You can begin to ask yourself, am I asking for too much? Is this me? Is this them? What's really going on here? And so part of the process of getting your power back is to identify your personal standards for what feels healthy acceptable, loving, and wonderful to you in a marriage. You never want to let someone else's standards, someone else's potential dysfunction dictate to you what you accept, what you tolerate, what you believe you deserve. That's essentially settling. It's trading what you know to be true for you for what someone else is willing to give you. And so you want to be in control of your own standards. You want to determine this feels good to me. This doesn't feel good to me. Okay. The other is to really spend some time making your own life plan and having some personal goals. When your marriage is challenging, it can literally drain the life out of you. And it feels like you're just going through the motions of life, not really living your life, not really looking forward to much because it feels like, well, I can't live my life until my marriage is in a better place. And I want to say no. No, no, no to that, that this is the perfect time for you to focus on yourself, for you to identify what really matters to me. What do I really value? What do I really want for myself in this life? What are the things that I enjoy doing? How do I want to spend my time? Who do I want to spend my time with? And what are the things that really delight my soul and bring me joy? When you can spend more time developing what I call your own personal joy plan, it literally creates like a bubble so that whatever conflict or disappointment you may be experiencing in your marriage doesn't impact you and weigh you down as much. The other thing to get your power back is to practice radical acceptance. So much time and energy is, you know, diverted to trying to convince a partner, trying to drag a partner along, trying to make a partner see things a certain way, when really the pathway to peace is to accept that sometimes people are where they are. 
That doesn't make them a bad person. That doesn't even mean that the way that they are showing up is personal to you. A lot of times when I'm working with my clients on this, I help them tap into compassion and understanding. We really begin to connect the dots for why their partner may be reacting and responding and doing the things that they're doing. And when you have that understanding, you judge it less. When you have that understanding, you're less personally offended by what they're doing and you can understand, oh, this is their conditioning. This is their coping mechanism. This is their attachment style. And it becomes less personal. And in that, you can exist in a state of peace where you can see them and you can see their humanity and not be personally offended or disappointed or feeling like they are doing something intentionally to you. And then the other thing that you can do, of course, is create boundaries. Boundaries are not consequences. Boundaries are not ultimatums. Boundaries are not demands. Boundaries are simply choices that you make for yourself on behalf of your well-being. I believe boundaries are beautiful. I believe boundaries can be both self-honoring and respectful of the other person. Because when you have healthy, effective boundaries, this partner that you have in your life gets to be exactly who they are and you get to do things to help yourself and protect yourself so that if they're not being the way that you think they should be, you are not dragged down into despair, into anger, into resentment, but you just allow them to be who they are and you know how to move and operate in a way that still feels good for you without a lot of energy going into trying to convince them to be different. And then the last thing that I want to offer you in terms of how to be more empowered in a difficult marriage is to expand your circle of support, particularly when I'm talking with women about this. One of the biggest challenges they face is feeling the emotional support that they are looking for. And so when you have a partner who maybe isn't able to meet you in an emotionally intimate way or an emotionally responsive way, you want to think about who else in my life can I turn to for this emotional support in a healthy way? So you want to have lots of friends, lots of connections, lots of outlets for you to get support, for you to get encouragement, for you to get validation, for you to get praise, whatever those emotional needs that are not being met in your marriage. You want to think about where else can I turn? What else can I plug into to connect with others, to have this need met in an adequate way and also in a healthy way? So I've given you a lot, right? We've talked about the hard parts of the marriage. We've talked about the ways we give away our power and we talked about the ways that we can begin to reclaim our power. If some of these ideas really sparked something for you and you're like, wait a minute, that would be really valuable for me. I want to learn more about that. I want to like explore that a little deeper and understand exactly what she's talking about. I want to invite you to tune into my podcast. It is called Love Marriage Again with Dr. Siobhan. I have several episodes that address these topics, but most recently I have two episodes that I want to link you to. One is how to create a more fulfilling life and the other one is stuck. Both of those episodes in combination will help you take the steps forward to reclaim some of your power, to reconnect to yourself and to move yourself forward in a positive way. And when you truly understand what is the specific place where I am stuck, what is the aspect of stuckness that I am experiencing in this difficult season in my marriage, then you also have an exact roadmap for what to do next to get yourself in a better position. So again, I will link to those podcast episodes here, but you can also search Love Marriage Again with Dr. Siobhan anywhere that you love to listen to podcasts. Thanks so much for tuning into this video and I would love to know what you think. So be sure to drop a comment and let me know what has resonated with you the most.